Hi everybody, this is lecture 24 of numerical methods at Bethel University. It's essentially a crash course in differential equations, so if you're a calculus or a differential equation student, there's plenty here for you. In fact, I'm not going to do any numerical methods in this particular lecture. I'm trying to get my students to the point where they can do some numerical methods with me in lecture 25. Also, if you're interested in lecture 23, I did a crash course on numerical integration. So lecture 24, I'm calling the Fundamentals of First Order Ordinary Differential Equations, DIFFEQs or ODEs for short, and their solutions. We're going to start simple and get more complicated. So here's the plan. What is the most basic kind of ordinary differential equation? I call it a pure antiderivative problem. We just integrate, essentially. The example we're going to talk about is free fall under the influence of gravity, which includes upward motion when you say free fall. We're, in fact, going to think about an example where the object moves upward first before it comes back downward. We're going to look at the solutions. What does it mean to be a solution? What does the graph look like? How do you understand the graph? And then talk about something called the slope field. The next most basic kind is something called the first order linear autonomous ordinary differential equation. That's quite a mouthful. We'll talk about what each of those things mean. The example we'll look at is exponential growth of a rabbit population. And we'll look at the solutions. What does it mean to be a solution? What do the graphs look like? What's the slope field in this situation? Then we'll move on to a harder example, a nonlinear autonomous example. It's a, also a population growth model. It's called the logistic model of population growth. Again, the solutions, what does it mean to be a solution? Look at the graphs, look at the slope field. We're also going to talk about a special kind of solution called equilibrium solutions. Four, we'll go on to another example, a logistic model with harvesting that's yet still another step up in difficulty. Finally, at the end, I will introduce a method for solution finding called separation of variables. Before we get to that point, I will just tell you what the answers are, but you should be able to verify that they are solutions. So here again is the most basic kind of differential equation. Pure antiderivative problems. I say antiderivative, some people say antiderivative. Doesn't matter. dy dt, or y prime, equals f of t for some continuous function f of t, where it's real important to emphasize that that function, little f, is a function of t alone, not y. Here's an example. Suppose the upward velocity of an object is, fol is the following function of time t in seconds. v, which is the velocity, equals f of t, is negative 9.8 t plus 30 meters per second. It's an upward velocity in the sense that it's going to be positive when the object moves up and negative when the object is moving down. This velocity has positive and negative signs depending on which direction the object is moving. The question is, what is the height of the object as a function of time? And once we have the height, by the way, we can solve other kinds of problems. We can figure out how high does the object go, go what's its maximum height, when does it reach that maximum height, when does it hit, hit the ground. But I'm not delving into those questions and answers. I'm trying to just find a function that gives me the height. Here's a partial answer. The height, call it y equals capital F of t, is an antiderivative, or again, antiderivative, of the velocity. In other words, it satisfies a certain differential equation. It is a solution of a differential equation. What differential equation? The one we see up there. When you differentiate it, when you differentiate capital F, you get little f. Okay? So that's a pretty basic kind of problem. We just have to solve the differential equation by integration, essentially. Yeah, this is just a calculus problem. We just need to integrate. In other words, the general solution, and realize when I say general solution, I mean an infinite family of solutions. There are infinitely many functions that solve the differential equation. Is this function that I find by integrating negative 4.9t squared plus 30t plus c, where c is arbitrary. Any value of c will work as far as solving the differential equation, though once you know the initial height, the c is determined. What is c? It depends on the initial height. Call that initial height y0. In fact, in this example, not always, but in this example, c actually is the initial height. If you plug in t equals 0 and set capital F equal to y sub 0 when t equals 0, because 0 squared is 0 and 30 times 0 is 0, you get c. c is y sub 0. It is the initial height. Therefore, in fact, if we think of y0 as being fixed, we get what we call a unique solution to an arbitrary initial value problem. Here's a general arbitrary initial value problem. We have the differential equation dy dt equals f of t, and the f of t is negative 9.8t plus 30. 
we have this initial condition y of 0 equals y sub 0. Now you should realize when I say y of 0 here I'm being, well mathematicians call it abuse of notation here. I'm using the letter y both as a variable name, in this case the height, and a function name. So I'm saying y of 0. Okay, That is a common thing to do in differential equations. As we get to the harder examples here, I'm going to do something different. And in fact, my students should be alert to the fact that what I'm going to do is different than what you're going to find in our, our numerical analysis book. Okay, I'm going to use a different notation. I'm going to use a function name. It's going to be a Greek letter called phi. Actually, some people call it phi, okay? but I'll call it phi. That's a common letter to use for solution function names, but our book doesn't do it. And in many differential equations books, don't do it but I want to emphasize the distinction ultimately between variables and functions. The unique solution, thinking of y0 is fixed. Okay, Whether a symbol is a variable or arbitrary or a constant is all in your head. I'm thinking of y0 as being fixed here. That gives me one unique solution. It's the same formula as before. Here I was thinking of the c as being arbitrary. This gives infinitely many answers. Here I'm thinking of y0 as being fixed. This is just one function. And to emphasize that I'm also going to put a subscript, capital F sub y0 of t, to emphasize that this depends on y0 as well. It depends on the initial height. All right, what do the graphs of solutions look like? The unique solutions of the infinitely many initial value problems are all vertical translations of each other. They have to be. They're all antiderivatives of the same function. They have the same slope at any given value of t. As the initial height y0 changes, the graph's just going to move up and down. This animation illustrates that. As y0 moves up, as the initial height moves up, the graph moves up. As it moves down, the graph moves down. Realize that for any given situation, y0 is fixed, so we'd only have one of these graphs. We're looking at infinitely many different solutions when we think about this. Also realize that the motion is up and down. It's not along a parabola. We are only thinking about up-down motion here. This is just a graph of y versus time, not y versus x. There's, a, there's something called the slope field that's real important to understanding solutions of differential equations, not just for this simple example, but for more complicated kinds of examples. Slope fields are real important. If at many points in the ty plane, we make little line segments centered at these points, listen carefully, with slope f of t, so we take the t coordinate of each point and plug it into the function f, then we have made a picture of something called the slope field for the differential equation and the solutions are going to follow the slope field. Since the solutions, capital F, satisfy the differential equation, their derivatives are always equal to little f for all t, any time a solution curve passes through a midpoint of one of these line segments, that line segment must be tangent to the curve. Solutions must follow the slope field. Here's a picture of the slope field that illustrates this. Notice you got a bunch of red lines. These are the mini tangent lines to the curve that are all constant in slope along vertical lines. And here we have two different solutions, the blue one where y0 equals 0 and the green one where y0 equals 30 that both follow the slope field. We look at one value of t, in particular t equals 2, and we see the slope is found by plugging t equals 2 into f to get 10.4. You can check that for yourself. Gives you the slope of those line segments, those mini tangents there. The slope field for any pure antiderivative problem behaves like this. Mini tangents that are constant in slope along vertical lines where t is constant. Let's move on now to the next most basic kind of Diffie Q. The next most basic kinds are what are called first order autonomous equations, where this right hand side function, the little f, is not a function of t, it's a function of y, and in fact it's a proportionality in y. You can say it's linear in y. y prime equals dy dt equals f of y equals k times y to keep it simple and linear for some constant k. This is very different. This is a function of y on the right hand side instead of t. This is where it can start to get confusing. Is y a variable or is y a function? Okay, and again some differential equations textbooks gloss over this. They don't make a big deal of it deal with it, but in my experience, people get confused by it, so I want to make the distinction. Y is at a variable or function. I will try to make the distinction. I'll try to really actually emphasize it's a variable and use a function name that's not Y 
for the solution. We'll get there here. Here's an example of a situation where this would apply. Suppose you've got a population Y of rabbits that grows exponentially at a constant continuous growth rate of 4% per month. What's the population as a function of time? And again, once you've found that function, you could answer questions like when will the population reach 10,000 rabbits or something like that? What's the doubling time, those kinds of things, using logarithms. Here's a partial answer. And actually, if you've taken pre-calculus, you should already know this. You should have learned the partial answer to this is exponential growth with base e. And the k, that constant of proportionality, is the multiplier of the t in the exponent of the e. Now we are talking about differential equations. We need to answer the question, do these functions really satisfy the differential equation? Are they solutions? By the way, before we look at whether they are solutions or not, you should think about whether a model like this makes intuitive sense. Why should the growth rate be proportional to the population size? Well, essentially, the more baby rabbits there are, the more baby rabbits there are. So let's go ahead and check this. But it is a bit tricky. You need to really understand carefully what it means to be a solution. What does it mean for a function? Here's my new notation. Phi of t, some people call it phi of t, to be a solution of an autonomous differential equation. y prime equals dy dt equals f of y. It means this. Listen real carefully. When the function is substituted into both the left-hand side, LHS, and simplified, and also substituted into the right-hand side of the differential equation and simplified, you get the same function of t for all t, wherever the function is defined. Okay. By the way, the fact that this is first order means the differential equation only involves a first derivative, not a second derivative or a third derivative. Differential equations whose highest derivative is second derivative are called second order. In the present example, for an arbitrary k, though in our example k is 0 0.04, we can verify this, the left-hand side dy dt is found by substituting phi of t into that, meaning take its derivative, find phi prime. Because of the chain rule, the derivative of phi of t will be ce to the kt times the derivative of k times t, which is just k, which is k times ce to the kt. What about the right-hand side? Replace the y with phi of t. That's the most confusing thing for people. The right-hand side needs to be simplified when you plug the candidate solution into it in place of y. So instead of a ky, I have a k times phi of t. But what is phi of t? It's ce to the kt. In other words, I get the exact same answer. This is a solution. These are equal, in fact, for all t. And it doesn't matter what c is. c is arbitrary. I'm thinking of k as fixed for a given problem. And in our given problem, k will be 0 0.04. You can try other functions here, by the way, besides functions of this form. And you'll see that they do not work. Okay? You take the derivatives. You plug them in the right-hand side in place of y, simplify in both cases, you do not get the same function of t for all t. Okay, give it a try. A general solution of this, in fact, is c e to the kt, or for our problem, c e to the 0.04t for, well, I probably should have say, said any constant c. This word here should be any. I guess I will change that after I make the um, Finish the video, and I'll make these documents available for you, and you'll see the word any in there. What does this mean? It means, first of all, that they all solve the differential equation. Every single function like this solves the differential equation. But it also means something else. It also means that you can prove that all possible solutions can be put in this form. That's actually harder to prove, okay? And it's not something that we're doing here. What about an arbitrary initial value problem, like with the free fall? They each have a unique solution, just like before, one given function. And in fact, just like before, c will equal the initial condition, though again, I warn you, c doesn't always equal the initial condition. The reason is because e to the 0 is 1. When you plug in t equals 0, you'll just get e to the 0 times c, which is c. The initial value problem, dy dt equals this, where y of 0 equals y sub 0. So here I'm being using abusive notation here, because again, it is traditional to do that here has this unique solution, but now I'm using the phi notation and the subscript as well to emphasize I have this arbitrary initial condition, but I'm thinking of this y0 again as being fixed. Again, whether something's a variable, a parameter, a constant, 
It's all on your head. Okay, so here, up here, I'm thinking of C as being arbitrary. Down here, I'm thinking of Y0 as being fixed. So that's why I can say the word unique. So if you know the initial population of rabbits, Y0, this is your model of how they grow. And again, you can solve other problems based on that. Again, you've probably seen this in pre-calculus. So you might be wondering, is differential equations really something new beyond pre-calculus? Yes, it is, as we continue to make our models more complicated and, and hopefully more accurate. Exponential growth is not accurate forever. It can't be. Okay. All right. Let's look at the slope fields in this situation. Here's an abbreviation that I actually just made up during this as I wrote this lecture. Folios. What does this mean? First order linear autonomous ordinary differential equations. The word autonomous emphasizes the right-hand side only depends on y. Autonomous in general means independent. Basically, you're emphasizing that it's the right-hand side's independent of time. It's an unchanging kind of model, you might say. Once again, the slope fields can be made. And again, these slope fields are equal to f of y, not f of t. So for every, any given point, t comma y, in the ty plane, you're going to plug, plug the second coordinate into f to find the slope there. The pure antiderivative problems had slope fields that were constant in slope along vertical lines, and therefore the solutions were vertical translations of each other. For autonomous differential equations, where the right-hand side only depends on y, and you plug in the second coordinate to find the slope, the slope fields are constant in slope along horizontal lines, and solutions are horizontal translations of each other. That's what I emphasize here. Okay, They're all horizontal translations of each other. Uh, that's a little bit of an overstatement within a given range of values for y, I should say. The distance, however, the horizontal, the amount of the horizontal translation is not y0, whereas with the pure antiderivative problem, the size of the vertical translation was y0, though it's upward when y0 was positive and downward when y0 was negative. I would encourage you to see if you can figure out what it is. Here's an example. Again, k is 0.04. I've got two particular solutions here. A phi sub 10 of t is this. Notice that has an initial value of 10 when t is 0. And phi sub 20 of t is this. Notice this has an initial value of 20 when t equals 0. And I picked the horizontal line at y equals 60. These two distinct solutions have a value of 60 at two different values of t, but the slope of those solutions is the same there. It turns out to be about 2.4. You can check by plugging into the equation when k is 0 0.04 and to the right-hand side. In fact, do point, 0 0.04 times 60 is what you have to do to calculate 2.4 right there. Okay. No matter what horizontal line you pick, those slopes in the slope field are going to be constant in slope, and solutions, therefore, are parallel, you might say, when you pass through a given horizontal line. Two different solutions are parallel there. Solutions are horizontal translations of each other. In different ranges of values for y, in this case, when y is positive, there are other ranges when y is negative, other solutions. All right, let's move on to a more complicated example, our first order nonlinear autonomous equation. Okay, so this is going to make it more difficult. It's, the previous one was k times y, a pretty simple right-hand side. This one's going to be more complicated. It's going to come from something called the logistic model. It's perhaps the most famous example of a nonlinear autonomous ordinary differential equation. Here it is. Well, down here it is. Suppose our rabbit population grows at approximately constant continuous growth rate of 4% per month when the population is small, but that this growth slows towards zero as the population grows. Suppose further there's a carrying capacity of L equals 1,000 rabbits. Okay. Um, carrying capacity is how much the environment can support. The equation has this kind of form, which when k is 0 0.04 and l is 1 becomes this, which can be written this way. Why does this differential equation make some intuitive sense? Why does it match these assumptions? Well, think about it intuitively this way. When y is small, when the population is small, y is close to 0, 1 minus y over l is going to be close to 0, excuse me, close to 1. And so this expression, k times y times this thing, will be close to k times y. Of course, you can also say it's close to zero, but as a linear function of y, it's close to k times y. So that means you've got exponential growth, just like the previous example, when y is small. On the other hand, when y gets close to l, 
say just barely less than L, like 0.999. Y over L will be very close to 1, and 1 minus that will be very close to 0. Y itself will be close to 1, this overall expression will get close to 0. I mean, it's close to 0 when Y itself is close to 0 as well, but uh, intermediate values, when Y is like L over 2, for example, this is going to be maximized. Okay, so it does. You do have solutions that go that uh, have these kind of graphs. They start off with a, a small slope, and you have an exponential kind of growth, but then they have to have to level off toward that carrying capacity. What's the general solution? You can use the method of separation of variables, which again I'm going to show you at the end of this lecture, to get what you would call a not quite ideal general solution. I'll say why it's not ideal here in a minute. This function right here. Okay y equals phi of t. Again, many books would just call this y of t. They might even write y equals y of t. Don't let that bother you if they do. But I'm trying to make a distinction between variable names and function names here. Equals this function, 1 over 1 plus c e to the negative 0 0.04 t, which can also be written as 1 plus c e to the negative 4, e to the negative 0 0.04 times t, all to the negative 1 power. We should check the solution. That's really the first thing we should do. I didn't tell you how I found this other than just saying it's by separation of variables, but you should be able to check it. My students, you should be able to check this. How? Do the same thing we did before. Plug it into the left-hand side of the differential equation and simplify. Plug it into the right-hand side of the differential equation and simplify. See if you get the same function of t in the end for all t in the domain of the function. Here's what the left-hand side is. Writing the function in this form allows you to differentiate it more easily, bring down the negative 1 to get the negative sign here, subtract 1 from this exponent, negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. Then because of the chain rule, multiply times the derivative of this function, which is negative 0.04c e to the negative 0.04t. Simplify a little bit, two negative signs cancel, you can put all this up top, you can write this as a, an expression to the corresponding positive power on the bottom. That's what the left hand side simplifies to. What about the right-hand side? We need to plug in phi of t in place of y. Now remember what f of y was. It was 0 0.04 y times 1 minus y. k y times 1 minus y. 0 0.04 y gets replaced by phi of t times 1 minus y. This is the most confusing thing for people initially. You get this expression when you plug in the function phi of t. Doesn't look the same. Don't give up. Keep simplifying. We can uh, get a common denominator of 1 plus ce to the negative 0.04t inside the parentheses. We can also multiply this fraction through once we've done that and put the 0 0.04 up top. And what happens when we do that? We get this, and then these 1s will cancel. This expression comes from the 1 here because the bottom is 1 plus ce to the negative 0.04t. And again, you get a square because this fraction gets multiplied through. Those ones cancel, you're left with this. It works. These match. We are very, very happy, okay? Very, very happy here that those match. Of course, you, can, you could make a mistake and they won't match. You hope you don't make a mistake and you see that they do match. Of course, if you're verifying that a certain function is not a solution, they will not match, okay? And that, that should happen without mistakes. It works. How about the unique solution of a generic initial value problem? Well, this function is not ideal. Let me go back to the other slide. This function is not completely ideal as a general solution in that no value of c will, for example, give you the initial value of 0. right? Because the only way a fraction can equal 0 is if the numerator is 0 and 1 is not 0. There's no value of c that's going to make this function equal to 0 when t is 0. However, it's almost as if by magic, if we solve a solution of a generic, generic initial value problem where y0 is a fixed constant, almost as if by magic, that problem is going to go away when we simplify enough. So again, here is my solution. I'm now plugging in t equals 0 and setting it equal to y sub 0. E to the 0 is 1, so it simplifies to 1 over 1 plus c. I can solve for c. Flip both sides. This means... 1 plus c equals 1 over y0, subtract 1 from both sides and get this, get a common denominator and get this. Now replace c with that expression right here in the solution, but then you can simplify. You can multiply the top and the bottom of this by the same thing, which effectively multiplies the whole function by 1 to get a y0 up top, 
a wise error here, and the wise error right there will cancel to leave you with this part right there. And look at that expression. That works even when y0 is 0. It gives you an, a defined thing, the 0 function, and in fact the 0 function, the constant function, phi of t always equals 0, is a solution of the differential equation. Why? Because its derivative is always 0, and when you plug it in in place of y, right there you get 0, something that's always 0 no matter what t is. So almost as if by magic, this expression is a solution that works for the uh, generic initial value problem no matter what y0 is. You could think of the y0 as being a c and call it a general solution and might, you might say it's a more ideal general solution than the other one too. But think of y0 as fixed when you look at this. And again this notation emphasizes that phi depends on a y0. This function, the constant function, phi sub 0 of t equals 0 for all t is a solution. It's called an equilibrium solution, sometimes stationary solution. Its graph is a horizontal line. The slope field has a bunch of little tangent lines that are all horizontal lines on the, x, on the t axis. There's actually another equilibrium solution. Maybe you want to pause the video and figure it out. Are you back? The other equilibrium solution is when y sub 0 equals 1. phi sub 1 of t equals 1 for all t. That should make sense too. That's the carrying capacity. When y equals 1, this right-hand side, 1 minus y right there, is always 0. And the derivative of a constant function is always 0. Something else to think about is what happens if your initial condition was higher than the carrying capacity. Maybe you want to pause the video and figure that out. We're going to look at what happens with that here when we look at the slope field. This time, slopes are again found in by substitution into the function f of y. So take the second coordinate of the point and plug it in. But now the function is 0.04y times 1 minus y. It's still autonomous. No dependence on t at the right-hand side. Autonomous, again, means independent. Independent of t. The slope marks, again, have constant slopes along horizontal lines, and solutions within given regimes for y are horizontal translations of other solutions. And here's what the slope field looks like. With 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 solution curves drawn in, Phi sub 0 of t is the constant function, always equal to 0. Phi sub 0 0.01 of t has an initial value of 0.01. 1,000 rabbits, that would be 10 rabbits. Phi sub 0.1 of t has an initial condition of 0.1. 1,000 rabbits, that would be 100 rabbits. Phi sub 1 of t has an initial value of 1,000 rabbits. This brings up a question about realisticness. Shouldn't the rabbits still be reproducing if there's a thousand rabbits? Yes, but the idea is they're dying off at the same rate and therefore the population is approximately constant. So the model oversimplifies it, as all models do. And phi sub 1.3 of t has an initial condition of 1.3, thousand rabbits, 1300, and the solution decreases toward the carrying capacity. The rate at which rabbits are dying off is greater than the rate at which they're being born. And all this kind of thing, the carrying capacity, depends on the environment. If it were 1,000 for this set of rabbits, it could be 10,000 for some other set of rabbits in another environment. Notice the constant value of the, the slope field, the constant slopes along horizontal lines. I picked the horizontal line at y equals 0.75 here. And the slopes of these two solution curves that are horizontal translations of each other are the same there. And they're found by plugging in y equals 0.75 into the right-hand side function to get 0 0.0075. The slopes of these are the same. The solutions, in a sense, are parallel for different values of time, note. But they are horizontal translations of each other. Though, once again, the actual amount of the horizontal translation is not clear. Okay? On to yet a more complicated model um, that we're really going to need, I'm going to need a computer for. We're going to use Mathematica to look at some things with this and another model here. Let's assume we have a population of fish now instead of bunnies. Why did I change to fish? Well, because we're going to go fishing, and that doesn't seem as bad as hunting bunnies or something. So we're going fishing. Suppose the fish population in a lake. And I guess thinking about a lake makes it more clear that you would have a carrying capacity because there is a limited area where the fish can be instead of bunnies, which can go anywhere. Follows a logistic model 
when there's no fishing. And let's once again assume time is in months and continue its growth rate of 4% per month. But now that we allow fishing, harvesting, at let's keep it simple, at a constant rate of H thousand fish per month. Okay? H thousand fish per month. That's going to be a constant rate. That's kind of an oversimplification too, because maybe people fish more in the summer than in the winter, unless you have ice fishing like in Minnesota. What happens to the population now? The new first order nonlinear ordinary for ordinary differential equation is maybe you want to pause the video and guess it. The logistic part represents growth at least when the population is small. We want to emphasize that the harvesting takes away from the growth. It's a constant rate, thousands of fish per month. H itself already has units of dy dt. Go ahead and subtract H like this, and like this, and like this, when k is 0 0.04 and L is 1. That's yet a more complicated kind of differential equation. I have purposely kept the H here unspecified. Why? Because I'd like to do a little exploration with you, and because I don't really feel like trying to solve that by hand for an arbitrary H. I, I think I could do it, but it would be a, a pain. Let's explore this model with Mathematica. Now, you don't have to have Mathematica to appreciate what I'm going to show you here, but we will explore this model with Mathematica. So, what I'm going to do here initially is I'm going to enter the right-hand side function, f of y. I have the k and the h in there. I'm making them subscripts here to emphasize that this is really a family of right-hand side functions for various values of k and h. I can plug this in, and I can use something called dsolve value here to solve the differential equation. Yeah, I don't really feel like solving that differential equation by hand. Can Mathematica do it? Yes, it can. And the answer is kind of wild looking. Involves k, h, t, c1 must be arbitrary. It involves the tangent function. That's kind of unexpected. Let's put an arbitrary initial condition in there. So I'll think of y0 here as being fixed to get the unique solution of an initial value problem. And the answer ends up looking a little different. Now, you might scratch your head and wonder why that happened. I'm not going to get into that, okay? But let's just trust the answer and essentially just copy and paste this down here. And let's go ahead and replace the k's with 0 0.04 and enter this as the, the formula for the phi function, the solution. Okay? That's kind of nice with Mathematica as you can just copy and paste. Before we look at the solution curves in the slope field, maybe we should verify that the function really is a solution. We should plug it into the left-hand side and right-hand sides of the differential equation and simplify and see if we get the same thing. Unfortunately, here with Mathematica, it's not going to look the same, okay? But it will be the same as I will verify by plugging numbers in. If I simplify the left-hand side, take the derivative of that with respect to t, I get this expression. If I now plug in particular values, I pick t equals 1, h equals 0 0.002, and y 0 equals 0.1, I get a number. Ignore this i part. That's just numerical error. You must be trying to do some complex arithmetic for some reason. But if I simplify when I plug that function into the right-hand side, it looks different. This expression involves a tangent. This one, for some mysterious reason, involves a secant squared, maybe that's related to the fact that tangent, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, and these look different. However, when I plug the same numbers into that expression, I do get the same number, 0 0.00165192, again, ignore the imaginary part, okay? So, not verifying it's a solution symbolically, you could plug numbers in. I could plug other numbers in as well, and it could be the, give me the same thing. So here's what it looks like. The blue curve is the solution curve. The red lines are the slope field. Do notice I could let y0 be negative and get solutions, but those wouldn't have any relevance for populations. What do solutions look like when h is 0, when there's no harvesting? They look like the same model we looked at before, the logistic model for different initial populations. But now, how about if I add some harvesting, some fishing? Let H become positive. Look at this. It's making sense. The population doesn't grow as fast if I allow harvesting. And in fact, 
if the harvesting is too large, the population, well, it doesn't become negative. You can't have negative fish, but it does go to zero at a certain amount of time. Does that happen no matter what the initial population is? Uh, no, actually, unless H is yet higher. Okay, make Y zero higher, then no, unless H is yet higher. And in fact, there's a certain high enough value of H where something called a bifurcation has occurred, and no matter how high the initial population is, it's going to die off. Make H smaller again, it might not die off. Okay, so this has some real life consequences, you might say, predictions. You, you'd need to test it against real life to see if it really is matching real life. It is oversimplified, but it's something that you can do, and it's an interesting thing to try to do. In fact, the study of bifurcations, these big changes that can occur in the behavior of a system of differential equations and its solutions is very interesting to me. It's one of my favorite topics. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint and do our last topic, separation of variables. I'm going to have four pages here. This is page one. I'm going to show you separation of variables in a non-traditional way but it's consistent with the fact that I'm thinking of the function name as being phi instead of y. I'm tr I want to separate the meaning of the variable and the function name, okay? So it's consistent with that. So this is an introduction to that. At the very end, I'll show you how the traditional way it's done. So what I'm about to show you is complicated. You'll probably need to pause the video and think, okay? But I think you can get it if you take the time. Consider the following problem. This is a different problem with no applications. That is neither, neither a pure antiderivative problem nor an autonomous. And it's also going to be nonlinear. The right-hand side is going to depend on both t and y. And this is where, for my students in numerical methods, it's going to be start to start to be good to think of the right-hand side as possibly depending on both t and y. As you read the beginning of chapter 5 in our book, you're going to see that kind of thing in the theory. T of y, it's a multivariable calculus function, a function of two variables, t cubed times y squared. Remember what a solution is. It's a function, call it phi of t, such that when I plug it into the left-hand side and simplify, and plug it into the right-hand side and simplify, I get the same function of t in the end. In the abstract here, the left-hand side is the derivative, Here's the tricky, part, the tricky part. Plug in to the right-hand side. You replace the y here with the function phi of t, which means for this example, since the f function is t cubed times y squared, replace the y squared with the function phi of t and get t cubed times phi of t quantity squared. To be a solution means these two things are true for all t in some interval. The interval could be the entire real line or it might be some smaller interval. It should definitely not be clear what phi of t would be. You know, this is very mysterious looking. Can we find it though? Yes. Let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that this that we found a solution. <laughs> it's funny. We're going to find the solution by pre pretending we found the solution. We're going to assume this identity is true for some function phi of t. Okay. So assume we found some phi of t where this is true for all t in some interval. Let's just rearrange the equation a bit. One way you can rearrange it is divide both sides by phi of t to the uh, phi of t squared to get it canceling on the right and get a phi of t to the negative 2 power on the left, or if you prefer, 1 over phi of t quantity squared for all t in some interval. As long as we're not dividing by 0, I could have added that condition, but we're just doing a derivation, so we're not thinking about worrying about those kinds of things. Now, if these functions, these expressions of t, are equal over some interval, and if the left-hand side, if phi of t itself is sufficiently nice, we should be able to integrate both sides. Right? You can integrate continuous functions, for example, and that should maintain the equality, at least up to a constant of integration, at least. We could write an equation like this with integral signs. Integrate both sides. I'm using indefinite integrals. I could use definite integrals, and that might be, you might say, a better way to do it, to interval, integrate both sides over some particular interval, but I'm not going to worry about that. Up to an appropriate additive constant. For all t in some interval, these are equal. So there might be a plus c1 on the left side and a plus c2 on the right side or something like that. 
if you pick C1 and C2 appropriately for the given phi of t, then these two things can be equal. The integral of the right-hand side is easy to compute, right? It's just t cubed. Integrate t cubed, get 1 4th t to the 4th plus, uh, I'm going to call it C1 on the right-hand side because I'm doing it first. That's the reason. But what about the left-hand side? Can you simplify that integral? This one. Well, if you stare at that long enough, maybe minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, year, years, all of a sudden you might be privileged to eventually realize that this integrand, this function I'm integrating, is the same as this function the derivative with respect to t of negative phi of t to the negative 1 power. Why? Well, check it. Differentiate that in the abstract. Bring the negative 1 down in front. Cancels with the other negative sign to give you a plus sign, phi of t to the negative 2 power, then by the chain rule times phi prime of t. It matches this integrand. The negative signs cancel. Okay, is that helpful? Therefore, I can integrate this by doing the negative of the integral of that derivative. But hey, when you integrate a derivative, you get the original function, at least up to a constant. Right? Think about that. First double check this. The derivative of this is this function I'm integrating, this integrand. And therefore, if you integrate it, you can do the integral of this function. I can bring the negative sign on the front. Integrate a derivative, you get the original function with the negative sign there. Um, plus a constant. Yeah, that's true. So I guess these two things here and here are equal, at least if C1 and C2 are chosen appropriately. And I could subtract C2 from both sides to get a C1 minus C2, and then multiply both sides by negative 1 to get a negative sign out here, bring the negative sign through, and maybe write a C3 here, where C3 is really C2 minus C1. And wait, look at this. I've, I've almost solved for phi of t. Now just flip the fractions, and I'll, I'll have solved for phi of t. So phi of t is 1 over this whole thing here. Which, if I multiply the top and bottom by 4, I can write in a little simpler form like this. And let's, instead of writing a C4, let's just call it C. Hey, that's a pretty nice formula for v of t. Did we, did we find the answer? Well, let's do one more thing before we check it. Let's think about an initial condition. If we have an initial value, y sub 0, that's non-zero, we can solve for c. Plug in t equals 0. 0 to the fourth is 0. I get 4 over c, and I can solve that for c. c is going to be 1 over 4 over y0. So that's why I assumed y0 was non-zero, so I don't divide by zero here. And then if you plug it in in place of c right here and do similar simplification as we did with the logistic model, we actually get something that works even when y sub zero equals zero. Plug it in for c right there. Multiply the top and the bottom by y0. Get this expression. I should have put a sub y0 here. And that is an expression. That is a solution no matter what y0 is. It's not defined for all t. It's going to have, you know, it's going to be defined at t equals 0. And when y0 is non-zero, it's going to have evidently a vertical asymptote at some positive value of t because of this expression on the bottom. Um, I guess it would be a, a negative value of t possibly when y0 itself is negative. This does work even if y0 is 0. And you can check it. And I'm about to check the solution here. Does it really work? Well, the proof is in the pudding, okay? That means the proof is in the checking. Just a, an idiom here, proof is in the pudding. In other words, we need to check it in the original ordinary differential equation, ODE. The left-hand side and the right-hand side. Here's the function again. What's the left-hand side equal to? Well, the left-hand side is the derivative. Here's the derivative. Check that. It simplifies to this. Take the time to double check these things using the chain rule here, differentiating with respect to t, y0 is constant. And plug it into the right-hand side, t cubed times y squared, the y gets replaced by phi of t, simplify, 
pay you again, get the same thing. It works for all T in the domain. Also note that it satisfies the right initial condition. Plug in T equals zero. You get T to the fourth down there. It simplifies to Y zero. That shouldn't be surprising. Okay. Can we also make the slope field? Um, sure, let's do it in Mathematica. I actually didn't pre-type it in though. So the differential equation is t cubed times y squared. Um, let's see, let's just do the, the slope field. Let's not worry about getting a solution in there for sake of time. t cubed times y squared needs to go here. Oh, something like this maybe. Let's see how it looks. Doesn't look so nice. It is there, but need to make these things bigger. Let's try point one here. Okay, well they're they're getting very steep. They look on they look like they're straight up and down. Let's go closer to zero. That's I guess that's related to the vertical asymptotes. Okay, that's better. Um yeah, it's not perfect. I could fiddle with these other things to try to make it look better, um, to rescale it to make it look better. I, you know, I could maybe even rescale the vertical direction here or something to make it look better. But that is showing the slope field, and solutions follow the slope field. And a solution that starts right here, the let's get rid of this frame and put some axes in. A solution starting right here at t equals zero would go this way and be almost horizontal for a while before all of a sudden going up and it would have a vertical asymptote. All right, final, that is actually the, the final slide. Oh, no, it's not the final slide, okay. Sorry about that. But wait a minute. Why exactly is this method called separation of variables? What, where do we do any separating of variables? Well, that's because it's based on the traditional way of doing it. Because of the way it's, the work is usually shown, we imagine dy dt to be a fraction, even though your calculus teacher said it's not a fraction. Or maybe sometimes they said, go ahead and imagine it's a fraction sometimes. It's a fraction that you can multiply both sides by dt and cancel the dt, and this leads to the following work. So I'm gonna multiply both sides of this equation by dt to cancel the dt on the left, and I'm going to divide both sides by y squared, and that's going to get all the y's on the left and all the t's on the right. That's the separation of variables step. Okay, that's why it's called separation of variables. All the y's are on the left, all the t's are on the right. The d, you don't think of it as being a variable. Now, integrate both sides. Integrate the left-hand side, integrate the right-hand side. That's what the left-hand side, the right-hand side integrates to as before. The left-hand side integrates to this. Now the goal is to solve for y before we solve for phi of t. It's really doing the same thing. Get the same answer as before, but with different no notation. Okay? So again, this is the separation of variables step here, getting all the y's on the left, all the t's on the right. You cannot always do separation of variables. Okay, some functions, some differential equations are not separable. For example, if the right-hand side were t plus y, it's impossible to separate variables. It's impossible to apply arithmetic operations to get all the t's on the on the uh, le right side and all the y's on the left side. Okay, just impossible. You can try it. Why does this work? Uh, the reason is essentially we can do this integral here that was on the previous page or another few pages ago by substitution. Let y equal phi of t, so dy is phi prime of t dt. In addition, the substitution itself works because of the chain rule because of the fact that the derivative of negative phi of t quantity to the negative one power is this, and that simplifies to this, which is matching that, okay? That's it, have a nice day.